Nobody thought it would happen. And when it did, not many realized their danger. The band played merry music as the ship began to sink. Even with lifeboats full of women and children descending to the sea, few felt overly fearful. Losing the Titanic was unthinkable. After all, it was unsinkable. Yet the world's most magnificent ocean liner was going down just the same. Survivors in their lifeboats gazed in horror as the Titanic tilted more and impossibly more until it stood upright on end. Then the big ship disappeared, taking 1,500 souls to their icy doom. What can we learn from the tragedy of the Titanic? Some vital and fascinating things are in store for us today. It is written. This is George Vandeman presenting as the answer to your deepest needs, the living Christ. Today, tragedy of the Titanic. It happened during the night of April 14, 1912. And here's how a leading New York newspaper described the scene on board the sinking Titanic. Stunned by the terrific impact, the dazed passengers rushed from their staterooms into the main salon amid the crash of splintering steel rending of plates and shattering of girders, while the boom of falling pinnacles of ice upon the broken deck of the great vessel added to the horror. In a wild, ungovernable mob, they poured out of their salons to witness one of the most appalling scenes possible to conceive. For a hundred feet, the bow was a shapeless mass of bent, broken, and splintered steel and iron. The story went on adding horror to horror, but not a word of that description was true. Not a word. Let me tell you why. The wireless operator on the rescue ship, the Carpathia, had been so busy sending personal messages for survivors of the Titanic that he refused to answer newsmen's queries. So the reporters simply invented their own account of the tragedy, just as I've read it. But what really happened? What was it like on board the Titanic that fateful final night? Well, passengers were enjoying the luxuries of their floating palace. The sea outside was perfectly calm, stars as brilliant as ever. Everyone felt perfectly safe, even though they were sailing through a minefield of icebergs. Why worry? The Titanic was unsinkable. Builders of the ship had boasted, you see. It featured watertight compartments which could be closed automatically from the control room. Any two of these compartments could be completely flooded without endangering the ship. Such was the feeling of security on the Titanic that someone was heard gloating God himself couldn't sink this ship. Imagine the arrogance. At 9.40 that evening, alert did come in warning of massive and deadly icebergs ahead. But the operator who received the alarm didn't realize how close the icebergs were. So busy with other messages, he set this message aside to bring to the captain as soon as he found it convenient. Whenever he happened to finish whatever he was doing. But tragically, the message never reached the captain. Shortly before midnight, the collision came. Most of the passengers aboard the Titanic hardly felt it. No sudden shock, just a vibration, a slight jar. Only a few realized anything at all had happened. When the ship slowed and stopped stopped in the mid-Atlantic, passengers wondered why. Just a few wandered out on deck to find out. One passenger did notice an iceberg pass a window and felt sure the ship had struck it. Someone in the smoking room did feel a bump, rushed out to find the cause. And he saw a mountain of ice towering 50 feet above deck A, which would mean 100 feet above the water. But there was no panic, no commotion. 
No confusion. After a while, the captain summoned passengers to appear on deck with their life jackets on. Some thought it was all a joke. Even when the order came to load women and children into the available lifeboats, many considered it merely a precautionary measure. Surely everyone would be back on board in a few hours. The mighty Titanic would never sink. Not until the first rocket went off did most of the passengers realize how critical was their fate. They knew that firing rockets was the universal signal of distress at sea. But even then, perfect order reigned on the ship. Every member of the crew stayed by his post. Engineers kept the decks brightly lit till the last. The band gathered outside on the deck and played along with the great liner, poised for its final plunge. Little by little, the ship began to list. Moments after the last lifeboat had been lowered, the Titanic tilted dramatically. Passengers in the lifeboat stared in horror as the massive vessel reached an absolutely vertical position, literally stood on end, motionless for perhaps four minutes. Finally, it disappeared into the depths with just a quiet gulp. The sea swallowed the mightiest, most luxurious ship of its time. Then it was that there rose the terrible cry of the lost men and women thrashing about in the ocean in their life jackets. Their awful wailing continued for about 40 minutes until the icy Atlantic silenced every voice outside a lifeboat. Those horrible screams would haunt the nightmares of the survivors as long as they lived. And when morning dawned, icebergs towered above the lifeboats dead bodies bobbing here and there, of 2,208 passengers and crew aboard, only 705 survived, all of them in lifeboats. Well, more than three quarters of a century have passed since the Titanic sank, yet we find ourselves more fascinated than ever with the tragedy. Perhaps our most memorable impression is the calm, quiet, behavior of the passengers and crew, calmness not so much from heroism, you understand, but from insensitivity to danger, misplaced confidence in human works. Historians today agree that Titanic tragedy need never have happened. And even when the, sink, the ship began to sink, not a passenger should have been lost. The direct cause of lost lives was the scarcity of lifeboats. The crew had ample time to evacuate every passenger, but there just weren't enough boats, not nearly enough. On the unsinkable Titanic, you see, lifeboats were thought unnecessary, hardly more than ornamental. But when that luxury liner went down, the only thing that mattered was finding a humble lifeboat. Not one soul survived without getting into a lifeboat. The Titanic of 1912. Doesn't it remind you of the world 4,000 years ago in Noah's time? Back then, you recall, the earth was doomed to be destroyed by water. God told Noah to build an ark, a big lifeboat, if you please. People thought the whole idea was rather ridiculous, hilarious. Why did they need a lifeboat? Their world was secure. They didn't need salvation. So Noah's warnings went unheeded. His ark became a laughing stock, a tourist attraction, anything but a refuge to save lost sinners from the fatal flood. And then the unthinkable happened. Everyone inside Noah's ark survived. Everyone outside that lifeboat perished. Oh, friend, do we find a forecast of our own time here? Jesus thought so. Thinking of Noah's flood, he left this warning for us in earth's last hour, Matthew 24, 37 to 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son, uh, will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. As it was, so shall it be. Two situations, 
strangely similar, Noah's time and ours, total inattention to repeated warnings, misplaced confidence in human works. Crime, yes. Wickedness, yes. But mostly just the routine of living. So sure, the tomorrow would be like today, swept along with a calendar in the crowd, but then comes the final fatal surprise. People in Noah's day didn't feel they needed a lifeboat any more than passengers on the Titanic did. But how about us today? Will we take God's warning seriously? When will we stop playing games? Some years back, a toy manufacturer released a game entitled The Sinking of the Titanic. Remember? On the huge box cover in Norman Rockwell style, an artist pictured the chilling night when the Titanic sank. You see lifeboats crammed with desperate survivors as the giant ship noses over and heads for the bottom. But inside the box cover, within a black border, you read these words. On April 14, 1912, the huge British liner Titanic struck an iceberg on her maiden voyage and sank within hours. Out of that disaster came this fascinating new kind of family board game, the game you play as the ship goes down. Fascinating game? Well, maybe for those who weren't there, but the sinking of the Titanic was not a game. The sobering question returns to us now. Are we playing games as our ship goes down? As disaster approaches this planet Titanic, do we postpone getting down to business with God? Oh, friend, time is running out. This world is poised on the verge of final tribulation. Just consider the headlines. AIDS, pollution, bombs, wars. From any human perspective, positive thinking is irrational. But thank God he has provided a way for us to survive. He has a lifeboat ready to save us from perishing. Just listen to these well-worn words. We've known them since childhood. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus, our lifeboat to save us from perishing? Yes, the life and death question for us is, what will we be doing with Jesus? John 3, 18, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. How can we escape the conclusion? Our relationship with Jesus determines whether we live or die. But there seems to be some confusion about this. What does it really mean to believe in Christ? Shall we review it again? First, we trust his sacrifice on Calvary to cover all our sin. We can't qualify ourselves for heaven by our own good works. The blood of Jesus is our only hope, but the way we live after we've been forgiven matters too. Jesus said in John 14, verse 12, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. See? So belief in Jesus requires action. In Noah's day, whoever believed God's message had to abandon his old world to board that lifeboat. And so with us, our faith in Christ requires that we obey God. Jesus put it so plainly in Matthew 7, verses 26 and 27. Matthew 7, right here, turn to it. Here it is. Look, not everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. My friend, do you want to survive the flood of tribulation during earth's final crisis? Then accept Jesus as your Savior, rejoicing that your sins are forgiven. Follow him with uncompromising commitment. Remember, without Jesus, we can't stand a chance. That's what the book says. The sinking of the Titanic brought an end to an era. That great ship was a symbol of human power and capability. Its loss ushered in the age of insecurity. 
1945, the mushroom cloud over Hiroshima introduced a new dimension to that insecurity, the nuclear age. And now in the 80s, we have terrorism and AIDS to think about. But despite our insecurity, we still seem unready to board the lifeboat God offers us in Jesus. We still feel able to manage ourselves. When will we learn that we can't trust our own power? When we can't even trust our own information? Listen, one interesting sidelight to the Titanic story was the inability of newspapers to get the story straight. Not only the illustration I've already given you, but the Wall Street Journal of all of the papers back then, along with some others, dismissed the bad news at first about the Titanic as an unfounded rumor. Listen to the editorial they published after the Titanic sank. The gravity of the damage to the Titanic is apparent, it said. But the important point is that she did not sink. Her watertight bulkheads were really watertight. She kept afloat after an experience which might well appall the stoutest heart. Man's brain has within it the spirit of the divine and overcomes natural obstacles by thought, which is incomparably the greatest force in the universe. Well, man's brains failed him that night the Titanic sank, didn't they? They weren't even capable of reporting the tragedy accurately much less preventing it. Human wisdom can leave us quite confused. One little boy watching television turned around and asked, Daddy, are we live or on tape? Not just our children wonder what is going on. We all need God's Word to tell us how to live in these times. There's no way to escape what is happening. I think of a newspaper cartoon a while back showing a car stop beside the road with a father changing a tire. Little fellow's looking out the window, restless and bored. The father says, we can't change channels. This is real. This is life. No, friend, we can't change channels if we don't like what we see in the world around us. We must face it all head on with the Word of God as our guide. Oh, I'd like to recommend our gift book for you today. No Place to Hide is its title. There's four chapters filled with vital and fascinating information on the second coming of Jesus and the signs of his soon return. The titles include The Tragedy of the Titanic, this message today, and others as well. You simply must get this book. There's no cost or obligation, of course. I'll explain in a few minutes how you can call toll-free or write for your copy, No Place to Hide. Now, come with me back to the Christmas season of 1987. Our nation's capital was in a festive mood. Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev had come to sign the historic treaty limiting nuclear arms. With all the banquets and the good-natured bantering going on, the world breathed a sigh of relief. Relief about the progress toward preserving peace. We can certainly appreciate, all of us, the interest our world leaders have in preserving peace, but let's not get our hopes up about any human solution. The Bible warns us in 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, and the third verse, I must bring this to you. Listen to this. Listen to this. Here we have it. Here we have it. Listen. For when they say peace and safety, see, when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Now, those of you who are mothers know all about labor pains. Suddenly, without warning, the birth process begins. Ready or not, travail is upon you. Well, just that suddenly, this world will meet its time of trouble at the last day. But listen, birth pangs may be painful, Yet there are signs of something wonderful on the way, a precious child, a new life. And so it will be when Jesus comes, a glorious day for God's committed people. It means disaster only to those unprepared. And just as the sinking of the Titanic ended in rescue, not drowning, for everyone in a lifeboat, so the coming of Jesus means rescue from a doomed planet for every true Christian. It's something we can look forward to. Jesus said in Luke 21, 28, Now when these things begin to happen, 
Look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. No, we don't have to fear the coming crisis. In Jesus, we can face with confidence the flood of trouble coming upon the world. So let's lift up our heads and rejoice too. But how much do we want to be rescued? Are we attached to the luxuries of this planet Titanic so that we refuse God's lifeboat, the Lord Jesus Christ? Do we imagine we can save ourselves by human works? Listen, when the heartache of the world's hurt becomes our own, when everyone we have trusted fails us, when everything we've held on to falls away, then this earth loses its fatal attraction. We have nowhere to turn but to our Lord. Then we'll get into God's lifeboat and fervently pray, Come, Lord Jesus. His coming will be the beginning of a wonderful new day, the end of tears and heartache, conflict and confusion, the end of a long, dark night. The last wave of heartache and trouble and death will have washed over planet Titanic, and disaster, having spent itself, will be no more. Oh, friend, I'm longing for that day. Are you? Would you listen as my friends, the heralds, sing for us, Redemption draweth nigh. Years of time have come and gone Since I first heard it told How Jesus would come again someday seems so real, then I just can't help but feel how much closer His coming is today. Signs of the times are and strife on every hand and violence fills our land still some people doubt that he will come again but the word of God is true he'll redeem his chosen few Don't lose hope Soon Christ Jesus will return Will return Signs of the times are everywhere Everywhere There's a
Thank you, heralds. That was so appropriate. Shall we pray? Father mine, if we've learned anything at all from the Titanic tragedy, it's that human security will fail us in times of trouble. Our only hope is salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us love him and follow him with all of our hearts until he comes to take us to your heavenly home. And we thank you for keeping us in Jesus' name. Amen. Today I have a book for you that talks about the big decision. No place to hide. A book about those passengers on the Titanic and about long ago citizens of a city named Pompeii. People who had to make a life and death decision. Someday all of us must make that one decision which will determine how we spend eternity. I believe this book, No Place to Hide, can help you find the courage and the wisdom to make the right choice. Please call or write us today and request your free copy of No Place to Hide. Now, here is the information you need. As a convenience, you may request the free gift offer by calling our toll-free number, 1-800-253-3000. Call right now. That's 1-800-253-3000. Remember, the offer is sent by mail, free and postpaid. You may have to dial the number more than once, but please keep trying. The operator needs only your name, address, and phone number, and the name of the offer you want. Call toll-free now, 1-800-253-3000. Lines are open now. That's 1-800-253-3000. If you prefer, you may request the offer by writing to George Vandeman, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. And now goodbye, everyone, but remember it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God.